don't you just love your pastor? She is one of the most genuine, kind-hearted, beautiful inside and out individuals that I think I know. And it, it's a gift to the church. She loves you guys. She loves the house of God. She loves the Lord. And she's such an example for all of us, for her family. Can we give her a round of applause? She's a very special lady. And I'm really excited to be here and to share today. And so Pastor Christy uh, gave you a gift. It's a journal that I put together, and it's called My Diary to God. And it has a scripture that kind of starts your day off. So you could read that and then see what God places on your heart and then begin to journal. Because I don't know if, if you realize it or not, but journaling, it helps to reduce stress, anxiety, worry. It's been known that if you will journal before bedtime, that you will sleep better and all those worries can kind of fade to the background because you're giving them to God. And so you can use this journal in so many ways. You can talk to God about what's going on. You can thank him for the goodness, his mercy, and what he's done in your life. And then you can just leave it before him and then close with prayer. So I hope you guys will en enjoy that. But like she said, I worked on a book for quite a while. <laughs> I think the journey for me took me like seven years because I was a single mom. And so I only worked on it when I had an extra hour here and there. And then finally I got really serious and I thought, you know, I'm going to finish this. And I began to kind of set out some goals for myself so that I could complete it. But it's called Chasing After Charming. How the search for approval bewitched my soul. And a lot of people will think the title's a little misleading and think, well, that's just about chasing after men. But charming can be anything. The word charming means to seduce, to lead astray, or to put you in a trance. So chasing after charming could actually be anything that leads you astray from God. Something that's more important than God that you've put in your focus and you've put God in the background, that can be chasing after charming. And for me, it was a really ugly journey <laughs> as I chased after charming. I, it was a relationship thing for me as part of it. I went from relationship to relationship, hoping to find that love that my soul really longed for. And, but I never found it. And so I kept chasing men and chasing these relationships. And the sad thing about it was I was always left wanting or broken from it. And then there was the chase for approval and recognition from a career or from a job, a job title that I chased after. I would work countless hours. I mean, it was ridiculous what I did. And I would put that to the forefront, put God to the back, put my family to the back, and I was chasing after charming again. And so it could be anything. And I think for women... I think one of the danger zones I know for myself is the chase of busy. Our lives are super busy. We wear so many hats as women. We're a mom. Some of you are wives. You're, you work somewhere. And so we begin to chase that busy. And before you know it, we are spiritually depleted. And we've left God in the background because we're too busy to stop, too busy to go to church, too busy to read our Bible, too busy to pray. And then we find ourselves in a desperate situation because we started chasing the busy. And so it's very, very important that we realize when we're in that situation. And so um, one of the things I think, like I told you for me um, in my early 20s, was that I was a goody, goody girl. <laughs> and I did everything right. I followed the rules. You know, I listened to my parents. I did everything, you know, like I was supposed to. Didn't drink, no drugs, no nothing. And then all of a sudden, I found myself looking for that recognition and approval from the world. And then when I resurfaced, I kind of fell off of a cliff. And when I resurfaced, I didn't even know who I was anymore. That's how lost I found myself. And I w allowed my feelings to begin to be my navigation system. And we all know our feelings can mislead us and will mislead us if they're unhealthy and not dealt with properly. And so the choices I made, little by little, kept leading me further and further away from God. And 
the thing about choices is that our choices either lead us closer to God or closer to the world. There is no in between. Um, if we find ourselves at a lukewarm place, we might as well say that we're closer to the world. And we have to be very, very careful when we start making choices about what we're chasing. And the scripture of 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. I love this because it's kind of straight to the point. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Isn't that so true? When we get captivated with what's going on in, in the world over our relationship with God, it squeezes out his love for, for him. And we find ourselves in a danger zone spiritually. And then it goes on to say, practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. That's our selfish nature coming out when we're wanting the world to notice us, recognize us. And that just isolates us from him. The world and all of its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. For me, the easiest way to say it is I was in love with the world. Or you could say I was in a relationship with the world. I put everything with God, anything to do with godly principles, completely to the background. If only I had fed my soul. If only I kept going to church, then maybe, maybe I could have saved myself so much brokenness and so much heartache. Because what happens with the world is it's, they offer us a twisted version of the truth. And it has such curb appeal. You know, it looks good, sounds good. And it, if you look in Genesis with Adam and Eve, the same thing happened to her. The devil's like, here, here's some twisted truth. Did God really say that, that, that you shouldn't eat from that tree? And that's what the devil does with us. Did, did God really say that was bad for you? And then we find ourselves in trouble because with Eve, that twisted truth that the devil offered, it appealed to her, her emotions. It appealed to her flesh. And the next thing you know, she had bitten into the apple. And that poison, that seduction that the devil had placed in front of her, that poison began to seep out. And then spiritual death is birthed at that point. So our choices are very important. And so I just I want to, I guess, it just emphasize today the importance of really thinking about what choices you're making in your everyday life. Because they matter. They matter for you. They matter for your soul, for your family. Because you're the example, like Pastor Abel was saying, we are an example to our family I remember when I was going through a divorce, I had gone to a counselor, and he told me, he said, the woman sets the tone for the household. And that's so true. We have such an important role that we can step into and be in a role for our families. And so what, I, what I'd like to ask you today, I'd like for you to consider, is there something that you're chasing today that maybe isn't healthy for you? Do you have your job in the wrong place? Should God be here and your job be here? Is it a relationship that is in the forefront versus God? So I want you to think about those things because it's so critical and so important because God wants all of our heart. He wants all of us. And sometimes I ask myself, God, do I, have I given you all of my heart? Because I see the busyness, I allow it to seep in at times and I'm like I'm too, oh, too busy to pray too busy to stop and really dig into the word and I know those things are crucial to my walk I know it's important to be planted in the house of God but yet I question sometimes God have I given you all of me and I think the other question I want you to consider if you haven't given your whole heart to him Let's say the world has half of it or your job has half of it and God has the other half. What do you need to do to adjust? Because if he only has half, somebody or something has the other half of our heart. And that's so important. And the reason why it's so important is because you and I are valuable to God. 
your relationship matters to him. And, you know, we can allow the, the world to determine our worth, but what we need to do is make sure our, we know our identity and our value through the eyes of God. And in Genesis 127, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. That depicts value. You were created in his image and his likeness. Number two, Psalms 139, 14. I will give thanks and praise to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful, God, are your works, and my soul knows it very well. I hope today that your soul knows it very well, that you are valuable to God. And then number three, I want you to really just consider your value because he gave his son for you and for me to die on the cross. And so those things depict value to us, not what the world says. The world's standards are going to change every other day of what they think value and worth is. And so you can't look to the world to find your value and your worth. You need to find it in God's eyes. Years ago, I was opening a brochure at a church that I worked for. And for some reason, this one particular brochure really stood out to me. My, my pastor always got invitations to go to events. And so I'm flipping through this women's conference brochure, and I just was just dead still on one particular page. And on it, it's crazy, it was a find-a-word puzzle. I don't know, are you guys familiar with those? I love those things. Here's an example right here. And I was just stuck because that word beautiful, it just stood out to me. Usually I wanted the competition of finding the word. How fast can I find them and complete the puzzle? But that day, that word, my soul needed to hear. And I hope that today you know that you are beautiful in God's eyes. And most importantly, if you look at the top of it, it says, I can see you. I can find you. And I like to say, love God. So whatever circumstance that you're going through today, maybe things are difficult. Maybe you feel alone, unlovable, depressed. Maybe there's some big circumstances that are going on too. God sees you. God can find you no matter what's going on. He can find you and he is there for you. And that, that's value. That is value. And not only that, true value is being known by God, by the King of Kings. That is value that the world cannot give you. And um, it makes me sad to think that I search for my value in the arms of the world. When the King of Kings gave his son for me, he gave his life for you. And if, if anything, hold on to that value. That's how important and how special you are. And value, it plays a very important role in the human makeup. Because our hearts, we long to be seen, to be known, to be heard. And if we're not careful, like I said, we'll look for it in other places than through God's eyes. A couple of years ago, my son, he... Uh, he texted me and my daughter and he said, hey, I want to bring my girlfriend home for you to meet. And we're like, excuse me, did you say girlfriend? <laughs> because he really hadn't dated that much. And he was in his mid-20s. And he was at grad school at Baylor in Waco. And we're like, sure, bring her home, bring her on home. And so we prepared everything. We wanted everything to look really nice, really pretty. We wanted her to feel super welcome. We wanted to, you know, extend the hospitality to her. And so when she came in, she was very lovely. We had a ton of questions for her. We wanted to know everything about her. We're like, who's still in my JoJo's heart? I mean, he's my boy, you know? And so we asked all these questions, and we listened intently to her. And so when they left that day to go back home, she lived in Dallas, um, they were debriefing on their drive back. And he said, so what was it like for you to meet my family. And I don't think I'll ever forget what she said. It really impacted me. She said, I felt so known. Isn't that how we all want to feel in a conversation with someone? That someone hears us, that someone really sees us, that they really love us. We want to be known. And that's how we want other people to feel. 
But the beautiful thing today is that's how God wants you to feel. God knows you. He knows everything about you. And he cares about you. And I think that that's, you know, something that is so beautiful that we really need to lean into. Um, let's see, Psalms 139, 1 through 4. I love this scripture. This is from the Passion Translation. It says, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and my soul. And you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. And you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. He knows you. Verse 5 and 6. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in your kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. You have laid your hand on me. I want to stop right here for a second. Imagine God. His presence so tangible that it feels like his hand is upon you. Can you imagine that? Saying you're not alone. Whatever you're going through, you're not alone. I have not abandoned you. I have not forsaken you. Because we forget. We have those onsets of amnesia sometimes. We forget today. We know he loves us. Tomorrow, we may be going through something and we forget. God, where are you? Don't you love me? Don't you care about what I'm going through? But to know that he's laid his hand upon me. To say, no, Lisa, go this way. No, go that way. I haven't forgotten you. I'm here. I'm here to comfort you and to show compassion to you. And it says, you have laid your hand on me. This is too wonderful, deep, and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder, and it brings me strength. You know, the Bible is filled with so many beautiful examples that God has not forgotten us. In Genesis chapter 16, 16, there's a story of a woman named Hagar. And I'm going to just give you a quick backstory because her story is really beautiful about how God just reaches out to her in a very difficult time. She was a bondswoman for a lady named Sarah. And you guys can read more about the story if you want to in Genesis 16. But she's a bond servant, and Sarah is older. She's older than I am <laughs> in, this time, in this part of the story. And she's not been able to have children. And so she comes up with plan B. We've all had a plan B that we should have waited for God's plan A. So she has a plan B. <laughs> and she goes to her husband, Abraham, and says, Hey, why don't you take my bond servant Hagar, and make her your wife? And perhaps she'll give us kids. Well, he didn't decline the offer. And so the next thing you know, there's chaos in the camp because Hagar gets pregnant. Sarah and Hagar get sideways with one another. And Sarah, it says, the scripture says, Sarah dealt harshly with her, causing her to run off. And so she runs off and she finds herself in the wilderness all alone. And she's by the spring of water. Then it says, but the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of the water in the wilderness. And he said, Hagar, Hagar, where are you running from? And where are you running to? Isn't that beautiful to know that he ministered to her in that moment? And what seemed like a wilderness situation, found her by a spring of water took time to question saying, where are you going? What's going on in your life? I care. God cares what's going on in your life. He cares if you feel abandoned. He cares if you need direction. And so he's taking time to ask questions, to listen intently and to say, I know you, I see you, I hear you, I love you. And I want to give you direction in this situation. You know, society could have easily dismissed her because she was a bond servant and certain circles she would have been completely overlooked because she didn't have a voice. But the angel of the Lord, isn't that powerful to know? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what our status is. It doesn't matter if you have a title. It does not matter. 
the angel of the Lord appeared to her to speak to her because God loved her. And I want you to know that God loved you. And if you found yourself today in a situation where you feel like you're sitting by the spring of water in the wilderness, I want you to know that God sees you and he wants to minister to you today. He wants to give you direction for your situation, even for your life. You may be making plans to go off to school, change jobs, get married, whatever it might be. But God wants to minister to you. He wants to guide you through life. And I hope you realize just how value, valuable you are to him. You know, for me, this was a struggle for me to realize my value through his eyes, to realize his love for me. It took me a while, but it's so tangible and so personal to each individual when you do realize it and you recognize it. You see, I was unfaithful. I was like the adulterous woman in a relationship, leaving God behind for something I thought was better. So when I came back to the Lord and when I repented, it was difficult for me to understand why would God love someone like me? Why would he love me? I intentionally left him, didn't want anything to do with him or the godly principles I had grown up on. Why would he love someone like me? There were a lot of tears I cried. And it's interesting, Kim, is the butterfly story is what changed my life. I cried. I'm telling you, worship every worship I'm bawling trying to go, God, why do you love me? Why do you love me? And then I was sitting in a Sunday school classroom. Pastor Earl was preaching, and he used the butterfly example. And for some reason, crazy reason, I'm sitting on the front row, and I'm trying to control myself from uncontrollably sobbing in front of everybody because that resonated with me for some reason. And the Holy Spirit just revealed God's love in that moment to my heart. And I finally realized grace is a gift. All we need to do, repent, say, God, here's my life, here's my heart, and receive his gift of grace. And you can't earn his grace. You can't earn it. And I was trying to earn it. I was trying to work my way clean, being good, being holy. And that's not what God wanted from me. At that moment, he wanted me to receive his gift of grace. And I hope that you in your life have received this gift of grace. In Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. This word, I have loved you with an everlasting love, that word in the original means lovesick. God is saying, I am lovesick with an everlasting love for you. I'm sure most of us have been in love. And there are those moments when you first, you fall in love. You can't wait to be in that person's presence. You can't wait. You're, you can't wait for them to text, to call. You're just excited to be around them. You are lovesick for them. And God is saying that about us. He's lovesick to be in a relationship with us. Isn't that beautiful to know that he loves us that dearly? Isaiah 54, 10, it says, For even if the mountains walk away and the hills fall to pieces, my love will not walk away from you. My covenant commitment of peace won't fall, fall apart. The God who has compassion on you says so. Isn't this the kind of love that we so deeply desire? The thing that we get confused with is that the love of a man, yes, it's special to fall in love and get married, it's, it's very special. But God's love, there's a place in our soul that only God's love can fill. And, we, and when we get that right, everything in our life can just fall into place. And it was that kind of love that, the, that God gave me that changed my life. It kept me from running from, to relationship to relationship, trying to prove my worth. It, it just it satisfied and quenched that longing within me. This next scripture is something that, um, it's almost like a love story to me. I think it's so beautiful. If any of you have read the story of Hosea, and it says, Hosea 2, 19 through 20, 
and I will betroth you, Israel, to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and loyalty and in compassion. I will betroth you to me in stability and in faithfulness. Then you will know, recognize, appreciate the Lord, and respond with loving kindness. Sorry, loving faithfulness. Um, I look at those characteristics. I will betroth you to me forever in righteousness, justice, loving kindness, loyalty, compassion, faithfulness, and stability. Man, how I've longed for those in a relationship, right? Those are some beautiful characteristics. And if you're not familiar with that word betroth, it is a biblical term that a bride and groom's family would use. It's like a contract. It's like a marriage agreement. They would enter into and determine the price of the bride. And once they agreed upon it, then it became a contract. So once the price for the bride was fulfilled, the groom could take his bride. So if we put that in the same context of God saying, hey, I'm going to betroth you to me forever. God paid the price for you and I. He bought us back from the world. He made a contract agreement. I'm going to fulfill their debt of sin with my son's life. And I will be there faithfully in stability and loving kindness and loyalty. And it is a contract agreement from now till eternity. I will never go back on it. And so the price to win us back from the world was his son. But he was willing to do that because he wants to be in a relationship with you and I. That's how special and valuable we are. And that should forever silence any lies that you may have heard that you were not valuable. Because on the cross, that silence is the enemy. To me, I look at the cross and I say, that's Jesus saying, he loves me. That price forever defines your worth. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's an agape love. That's the name of this event. An agape love is a love called out of one's heart by the preciousness of the object loved. That's how much God loves you. He calls it's an agape love. It's the highest kind of love. It's the noblest kind of devotion. It's self-giving a concern for welfare of others. He cares for you. And the magnitude of that gift should silence everything else. You should never, ever question your value again. Years ago, um, my brother-in-law, he, uh, he's a rancher, and so they, have a, they had a big piece of land that he, uh, that he worked on. And it was so big that even when the kids were teenagers, they said, oh, hey, we found the lost barn. They didn't even know it was there. That's how many acres of land were there. And he took care of the cattle and all the different things on the land. And one day he was coming back, and he saw a baby deer. And the mother was nowhere to be found. And he knew that if he did not take that deer home, that she would probably not make it. So he did his fatherly instincts kicked in, and he took the deer back. And they began to bottle feed her. And they, at one point they thought, well, she'll just leave, go out to the wild. She'll never come back. But she just kept coming back. Time after time, they would feed her. They would have fun. We had pictures with the kids with her. But fall was approaching, and they used to lease out the land to hunters. And so the kids are like, Dad, what are we going to do? What about Belle? What are we going to do with her? We don't want the hunters to kill her. And so the hunters came, and they said, hey, here's your cabins. Here's the lay of the land. And they said, Carl Max said to them, hey, there's one deer that you cannot harm on this land. One deer. And they said, how in the world are we going to know which deer that is? And he said, when you're looking through your scope, you will see a deer that has been marked. It has a collar and a bell around her, name, her neck. <laughs> and you will know. You cannot harm her. And that story to me just reminds me of God, how he has marked us. He's marked us to protect us from the enemy, from the world. He wants to protect us. His fatherly love kicks in. So Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, it says, And you also, 
were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You have been marked with his love. Song of Solomon's 2-4. He has brought me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. I want you to think about that. I wish I'd done a, a PowerPoint slide for this, but um, I want you to think about, do you remember those airplanes that used to have the banners flying behind them? These, this banner in this particular scripture is saying that it's about a 30-foot tight military banner. So picture God flying an airplane saying, Lisa, I love you. Pastor Christy, I love you. I am lovesick to be in a relationship with you. I have given my all to define your worth and to tell you I want to spend an eternity with you with an eternity. Psalms 139, your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful, God. I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them. I couldn't even begin to count them any more than I could count the sand of the sea. That's how special you are. An agape love. When I began to realize that and surrendered my whole heart, that's when I finally realized God is what completed me. And I know we've probably heard that statement, you complete me. We've heard it from a movie. And it sounds kind of corny, doesn't it? But I'm here to tell you that it's true. God will complete you. He will bring you the happily ever after. He will define your identity. He will bring you joy. He will bring you happiness. He will bring you success. He will bring you everything that you ever desire because he loves you. But we have to get this relationship right. Him first. And then the other things, you can't be chasing after the things of the world. Those things will lead you astray. It's in him. That's where your identity and your value lie. And I want to close with this one scripture. I hope that today that you have grasped how precious you are to him. That he sees you, he values you. And he's wanting to minister to you if you've found yourself in a situation. But you've got to pause before you run ahead. You've got to stop and you've got to call on him and give him an, an opportunity to give you direction. Don't allow your feelings to guide you. Or may I, let me say it this way, misguide you. Allow God to speak into your situation, just like he did Hagar. He had some specific instructions for her. And every time we pause at the spring of water and we wait for God to come and minister to us and we begin to call out to him, we begin to listen to him, we can get the directions that we need for our situation. Second Samuel 22. I'm sorry, I don't have this on the screen. God is the bedrock under my feet, the castle in which I live. He's my rescuing knight, my God the high crag where I run for dear life. A hostile world, I called to God. I called to my God. I cried out. From his presence, he heard my call. My cry brought me right into his presence, a private audience. Isn't that beautiful? Our cry brings us just him and I, you and him. It's all so personal, that space between you and God. When we will stop and linger for him to minister to us, Oh, it's so powerful. His presence is life-changing. Just a side note. I'm thinking about the rod of Aaron. They, had, they were to bring all these rods and put them in the presence in the Holy of Holies. And these rods had been, they were stripped pieces of wood that were dead. They were no longer attached to a root. There was no, nothing blooming from it. It was a dead piece of wood. It was like a staff. So they took these and they put them in the Holy of Holies. And there was a purpose for it. But what I want to get at is there's something life-giving that happens when you are in his presence. Because the next day they bring all the staffs out 
And lo and behold, if Aaron's wasn't budding and blooming. So in his presence, that's where you find life for your soul. Second Samuel 22, but he caught me. He reached all the way from sky to sea. He pulled me out of the ocean of hate, that enemy's chaos, the void in which I was drowning. He stood me up on a wide open field. I stood there saved, surprised to be loved. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. So today I hope that you realize that I've been able to um, drive the point of his agape love for you, that there you are precious in his sight, so precious that, you know, he, he wants to spend eternity with us. And if we will make that our focal point, so many things in our life will just balance out. And also that you would know your value and your identity in him because that's life-changing for, for anyone, especially if you're looking to the world to, I don't know, even have a social media platform to be recognized somewhere. Those things are so misleading. Don't get caught up in those. And um, I'd like to pray for you, if I could, before I, before I exchange the microphone out to the next person. Would you bow your heads? Father, I thank you. Thank you for your agape love for us. I thank you that you're lovesick to be in relationship with us. I pray, Father, that today we would put you first and foremost and that it would be as important to us to be lovesick to be in a relationship with you. God, that you matter most. I thank you, Father, that you, um, as King of kings and Lord of lords, that you see us no matter we, where we are. Even if we run away uh, from you, whether we're doing things we shouldn't be doing, I thank you, God, that you still want to give us direction. And I thank you, Lord, if there's anyone here today that is pausing by the spring of water, thinking about doing something they shouldn't be doing and they know it, or maybe it's a past thing that is holding shame over their head, I ask that you would minister to them today and that you would remind them, Father, that they are valuable, important, and loved by you. I thank you, God, for your word that is living and alive to convict us when we need be, to be convicted. I thank you that it guides us, it leads us. I thank you for a community of women that gather together, like Kim said, iron sharpens iron, that we can sharpen one another, we can grow, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you continue to bless this house and these women of this house, the community things they've done, the next things that are on the agenda, Father, that they would grow in you, Lord, that we would see your gifts operating within them, Father, and that we would see the lives that they influence changed even. So we give you praise, God. And if there's anyone here that's feeling depressed, lonely, unlovable, God, would you fill their cup today to overflowing with your living water that they would be satisfied by your presence and not the arms of the world in Jesus name. Amen.